Hey, hey, welcome, folks. Welcome to our first of many lectures on international business that we're going to uh, conduct this fall, autumn. September 1st, and it actually feels like autumn out there. I know it's going to get hotter, but it uh, feels pretty nice right now. Hey, a little bit of housekeeping first. I want to make sure you can see and hear me all right. So do me a favor, put a quick uh, note in the comments there. Let me know that you can see and hear me. That way we can go ahead and, and get started. So let's, let's make sure that's up there. We'll get somebody here in a moment. In the meantime, what I'm going to do is, uh, ah, here we go. Alma says, yes, can see and hear. Fantastic. All right, let's go ahead and do this bad boy. So um, what I'm going to do today is I have this PowerPoint presentation that we're going to be going through. I say PowerPoint. There's actually a lot of interactivity going on here. Um, throughout this lecture, I will be asking questions. I'll be encouraging comments and so forth. And in fact, to that point, I'd like to point this out here. We have um, a section for awesome comments, contributors, referencing past lectures and real world examples. Now, each time I see some of these, I'm going to go ahead and and give us a point in there and uh, or at least, you know, start to build them up. And the idea here is the more comments we get, the more folks who contribute and the more references we get to past lectures not just in this class, but any class that you've ever had, and more comments that relate what we're talking to, to the real world, to real life, then the more that's going to build up and there's a little something extra for you in there if we can get any of these up to 10, okay? All right, hey, we have Nicole with us, fantastic. Daniela's with us, that is great, good deal. So um, let's go ahead and start. Globalization. Um, what we're going to be doing today primarily is defining globalization. Today we're going to define globalization, talk about what it is, what it means. And then when we come back on Thursday, we are going to talk about the concerns and troubles with globalization. So first, let's define it. Now, if you were to crack open just about any textbook, um, this is a definition you're going to see. The shift toward a more integrated and interdependent world economy. Now, let me go ahead and get a highlighter there. I want to look at a few words. Shift toward a more integrated and interdependent world economy. We're going to talk about shift here in a moment. Integrated world economy, meaning everything's part of the same economy. It is all integrated. It's not there's a U.S. economy and there's a British economy and there's a Spanish economy and there's a Welsh economy, yada, yada. It's all integrated right? One economy, it's, you can't really easily delineate lines between one economy and another. Interdependent means we need each other. It's not, ah, oh, well, you know what, if the Spanish economy tanks, it's not going to affect us. No, 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 no. <laughs> We are interdependent. We need the Spanish economy. We need the Swiss economy. We need the Chinese, the Japanese economies. We are all interdependent. If one hurts, we all hurt. Okay. So with that in mind, I say, well, you know what? This idea that it's a shift toward this, you know, this shift, it's, um, it's been going on a long time right? Um, we've been in a world economy from just about the beginning on. Um, we have the, you know, uh, what is the, the Silk Road that, you know, all kinds of nomadic trading and so forth is going on throughout the Middle East and Far East and so forth. We had uh, India trade going on, spices and so forth. 
and why you can't see him back here. That little dude right there. Well, heck, here, I'll uh, pull it up here. You still can't see him hardly. That's Christopher Columbus. Well, now, why am I pointing out Christopher Columbus? Well, because it's exactly because we're in a world economy that we discovered, in air quotes, you know, this continent. So old Chris, he was looking for a new trade route to India from Europe. And so he just kind of figured, well, if I just sail west, I'll eventually hit India. Well, what he didn't realize is that there's a whole continent, the Americas, North America, South America, Central, all the Americas were there. So really, the mere fact that you and I, presuming that you are sitting in the U.S. right now, the mere fact that we're sitting here is because of global trade. All right. We are here because global trade was looking for a new route. So this shift that has been going on, it's been going on for a long time. Now, granted, today our economy is highly interdependent and integrated. Um, so, you know, hey, Shalise, welcome. Not a problem at all. Um, so it's it's much more today than it ever was, but it's been this way for quite a while. Okay, so let's play with this a little bit more. Let's first talk about globalization of markets, okay? Now, if we look at a textbook definition of what is globalization of markets, well, it's markets are no longer viewed in terms of distinct national markets. Instead, instead, separate regional markets are merged into one global market, okay? So, for example, McDonald's doesn't worry about what is the U.S. market. They probably talk more about what is the North American market um, because, you know, that's the region. And then they're going to talk about the APAC market meaning Asia-Pacific market, APAC. Then they'll look at the EMEA market. That's Europe and so forth. So what companies are doing is they're just kind of saying, all right, we're all over the world. We're all over the world. So it doesn't make sense to look at very specific markets when it comes to planning. We look at regions, okay? So let's take McDonald's, for example. McDonald's has close to 39,000 restaurants in 119 countries, and they employ one and a half million people. Well, it's a U.S. company. Well, what part of it matters that it's U.S., right? When you employ one and a half million people across 119 countries in close to 39,000 stores, okay, some of them are in the U.S., but a lot of them are in Europe, a lot of them are in Asia, a lot of them are in South America, a lot of them are all over the place. And so McDonald's doesn't really view the world market as you know, all right, we're in the U.S., we're a U.S. company, we, we, we cater to U.S., but we kind of branch out here and there a little bit. No, they're a world company, okay, that just so happens to be headquartered in the U.S. For the time being, as you know, 7-Eleven is headquartered in Japan, right? These things move around and change. By the way, that's a picture there. I didn't take that particular picture, but that's a picture of the McDonald's on the Champs-Élysées in Paris. And yeah, my wife and I ate there just because we couldn't imagine a better example of irony than to eat at a McDonald's on the Champs-Élysées. Okay, so that's globalization of markets. We also have globalization of production. Now, the sourcing of goods, meaning where we get the stuff we need for, for production, the sourcing of goods and services from all around the globe to take advantage of 
local differences in cost and quality of things um, as much as labor, materials, capital, and other resources. In other words, when we're producing goods, we're getting stuff from all over the world. What decides where we get stuff? Well, where did they grow it? Where is it least expensive? Where is it the highest quality? Where do they have good distribution channels? All kinds of things. All the sort of things that we're going to talk about in this course. So, for example, if we look at Starbucks, um, a single cup of Starbucks coffee um, can depend on as many as 19 countries. So we're looking at coffee beans, we're looking at milk, we're looking at sugar, we're looking at the paper cup, which is made up of its own constituent parts, right? Starbucks coffee is a global hub that connects some of the poorest countries with some of the wealthiest, which we're going to be talking about, especially on Thursday. But you have some of the poorest countries in the world helping produce a four to five dollar cup of coffee for the hipsters out here in the US. All right. So we're going to be discussing that. But the point of this particular piece is everything is sourced from all over the world, all over the world. And Shalise just said, that seems crazy. I never thought about it that way. It's really true. You know, the, it's, it's a fully integrated economy, okay? And now we have one contributor and an awesome comment. So we get to start seeing those uh, numbers go up. Trust me, you'll want them to go up. There'll be something at the end for you if they do. So keep contributing. Very good. Okay, so we have globalization of markets, which means we'll take anybody's money, right? It's it's we don't look at, you know, countries, we look at regions, we look at the entire globe, and we have globalization of pro of production, meaning we source all the materials and services we need from all over the world wherever they can make it, wherever they can make it cheapest, wherever they have distribution channels, all that sort of stuff. Okay. So then what about the whole made in the USA? You've heard this term before, made in the USA. Um, I'm going to ask a serious question. I want you to really play with this, okay? What I'd like you to do is put in the comments um, a product, and it can be as simple as you can imagine, any product that is made in the USA, okay, as USA as you can imagine, all right, any product that's made in as USA as you can imagine, and then let's play with that. Now, I know, and you know, this is going to be kind of a fool's errand, but let's play with the idea a little bit. So, let's go ahead and think about that. Okay, fantastic. Let's take a look at some of these. So first of all, I see at least four people who have contributed. 
So we're going to take this up to five people contributing. All right. Um, and then I see, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight awesome comments. So that gets us up to nine. Something happens at 10. So let's bring that up to nine comments. Awesome. Now let's look at some of these. All right. So we have some products. My guess is that you went online and that's totally cool. Totally cool. You went online to kind of find some products that are made in the USA. So Mag Flashlight, I'm well aware of Mag Flashlight. They're awesome flashlights. And I do believe they have a made in the USA label on them. Okay. Uh, KitchenAid, my wife and I, we own a KitchenAid and they're great. They're awesome. Uh, the Kirkland, you know, the water bottles, okay, the water bottles, Weber, gr Weber grills, it's probably called Weber grills. I have a grill. I don't know if it's a Weber, but I'm well aware of them. Um, Wilson footballs, Gibson guitars, Gibson guitars comes up a lot, guys, um, because, oh, and Daniela, fantastic. Daniela, you're saying Whirlpool appliances. Okay, so first of all, Awesome comment, a new contributor, which means you guys have had 10 awesome comments. Okay, fantastic. And Yasmin, you've got create uh, um, crayons. That's great. Okay, so we have a new contributor. These are really good. Okay, and Fact is, they may very well have a made in the U.S. label. So with that in mind, let's find out what that means. OK. In order to have a made in the U.S.A. label, that's called a unqualified made in the U.S. claim. And I believe that, you know, all of the products that you mentioned there are likely unqualified made in the U.S.A. Let's see what the um, Federal Trade Commission, the government Federal Trade Commission, let's see how they define a made in the USA product. For a product to be made in the USA or claim to be of domestic origin without qualifications or limit, virtually all the product must be all or virtually all made in the USA. Okay, all or virtually. Uh, my carbonite is freaking out. Go away. Um, all or virtually all made in the USA. Okay. Um, Gibson guitar. Yeah, totally. Those things are like handcrafted, baby, here in the USA. Crayola crayons and the grills and the footballs and so forth. I've seen videos of them making the footballs. It's really cool. And yeah, those are U.S. factories. Okay. Um, well, virt all or virtually all. What does all or virtually all mean? Well, watch this. All or virtually all means that all significant parts and processing that goes into the product must be of U.S. origin. That is, the product should contain no or negligible foreign content in terms of significant parts. So let's look at what they mean by that. Raw materials. Let's look at the raw materials. Well, it depends on how much the products cost raw materials make up, you know, and how far they are from the finished product they made. So I'm going to take, um, let's take the grills, for example. Let's take the, the Weber grills. They're made of metal, right? Well, here's the thing. Um, I think a Weber grill would very much count as made in the USA, even if the metal is from overseas. Why? Well, watch this. Let's talk about gold rings. If the gold in a ring is imported, an unqualified made in the US claim um, for the ring is deceptive. You cannot call a gold ring made in the USA if the metal, if the gold is from overseas. Why? That's because of the significant value of the gold. And it's likely to represent the, you know, 
it's going to be the value of the gold represents a high ratio of the value of the item. In other words, the raw material of the gold was worth $1,000 and the ring is worth $1,200. Well, 1,000 of that 1,200 is the mere fact that it's gold. And that's from overseas. And because the gold is an integral component, it is only one step back from the finished product. In other words, a nugget of gold isn't all that different from a ring of gold. Therefore, you really didn't do that much to it to really change its value. Therefore, you cannot call that gold ring made in the USA. On the other hand, let's take a clock radio or a Weber grill, right? By contrast, consider the plastic or the metal um, in the plastic case of a clock radio um, made in the USA. If the plastic case was made from imported petroleum, a made in the US claim is likely to be appropriate because the petroleum is far enough removed from the finished product and is an insignificant part of its value. So let me explain. Um, yeah, okay, the petroleum to make this clock radio or the ore to make your Weber grill, um, Nicole, it's from overseas. However, you got to process the crap out of that thing, right? You can't just take petroleum, put it in a clock radio. You can't just take ore and put it in a grill. You got to process it and you got to change it. And you've got to significantly change the character of the raw material. And because you have significantly changed the character of the raw material, it's now no longer that raw material. It's very much removed. Whereas a gold ring wasn't very far removed from the raw material. Furthermore, the value of the item, such as a clock radio or a grill, has very little to do with the value of the ore or the petroleum, okay? Therefore, yeah, made in the USA. Thing is, guys, we're still talking about foreign components. We are still talking about a highly integrated and a highly interdependent world economy. So when something claims to be made in the USA, understand that there is no such thing as 100%. No such thing as 100%. Furthermore, the rabbit hole get, just gets deeper. What about the origin of the machinery used to make or assemble the stuff, right? So the machinery may, you know, when they're making Gibson guitars, they might be using equipment from Germany because it's like the best equipment ever, right? Or they might be using, um, you know, machines and lathes that were made in well, Germany makes the best lathes, but you know what I mean, right? Um, and how about the raw materials that went into making that equipment? Okay, so yeah, sure. Um, I'm looking for something basic. Um, I don't have anything basic around, but if I hold up a chisel, I could say the chisel was made in the U.S. And therefore, but the, the blade of it was made from ore from another country. You get what I'm saying. And then you have the facility in which it was made. So the building in which Gibson Guitar is making their guitars, well, it's made of all kinds of stuff. And it's being powered by petroleum and so on and so forth. And then you've got the workers themselves. Well, the workers themselves could be very well from other countries. And the workers themselves are fueled with food that I guarantee you is from another country. I guarantee you that if you go to your um, refrigerator right now, it is full of foods from other countries because this is how we're able to get food out of season, right? So there is no such thing as fully made in America. Now, Shalise, she asked the question, how do we know when ch child labor is happening? 
That is actually something we are going to do a deep dive into on Thursday. So hold on to that thought. Um, it is an awesome comment. It's a great question. Child labor is very important. And we're going to talk about on that on Thursday. And spoiler alert, I have some really bad news for you. Child labor is everywhere. But more on that on Thursday. Okay. Okay. Um, let's play with American cars for a moment. All right. Um, I'm going to come here to this website. It's going to make me want to get out my, uh, pointer here. And let's take a look at this. I'm going to bring that over here. Okay. Some interesting things about made in America cars, right? Oh, by the way, Nicole said, I, I work in lighting, and this is a huge rabbit hole for us. When it comes to some government-funded jobs, it literally comes down to how much they, you know, what their word is and what percent is American. So, by the way, real quick, I'm going to come back over here. That is a great real-world example because Nicole is absolutely right. Government contracts oftentimes need to be 100%, well, you know, unqualified made in American services and products. We're going to talk in depth about that in this class. Excellent and great way to connect that to the real world. Um, and then we have uh, finally, sorry, I was unable to uh, make uh, comments. Okay, you're in the comments. And, and by the way, we'll, we'll add that one here in a moment. But let's talk about made in American cars. Um, here's the thing. Interesting thing about this list. First of all, number one, Ford Ranger, two, Jeep, all right, Tesla. But then we got number five, the Honda Odyssey, uh, the Honda Ridgeway, the Honda Passport, Chevrolet Corvette, another Tesla, Chevrolet. Now, this is fascinating mostly for me, because I look at this list every single year. I have looked at this list every year for the last 10 years because I've been teaching this for quite a while. What's really interesting to me is that this is the first time that I've seen this list and have seen the majority of the top 10 be U.S. auto manufacturers. Um, for ages and ages, Toyota was number one. Toyota was the top auto manufacturer. And Honda was right up there as well. And as you can see, Honda still has some players. But we are going to see in this class how government policies definitely influence where things are manufactured, how much of them are manufactured in the U.S., and so on and so forth. Because I promise you, the fact that the majority of these now are Ford and Chevrolet and so on and so forth is not by accident. Government policy went into shifting these from, from Japanese auto manufacturers to U.S. auto manufacturers. But trust me when I say... If you're getting a Honda or a Toyota, you're getting an, an awesome American car. We're going to look at what that means throughout this course. Okay. All right. So let's come back over here. And by the way, we now have a new contributor. All right. We actually have two new contributors. All right. Fantastic. So, American cars, even they are not 100% American, but, you know, it's how it's measured. And some foreign brands, such as Honda, can be very, very American cars. And even like the Ford, like if you get the Ford Fiesta or the Ford Focus, both of them awesome little cars, uh, they're mostly Mexican cars. Most of those are made in Mexico. Awesome little fantastic cars. So if you're looking at a Fiesta or Focus, go for it. Hot, hat, hot hatchbacks. Um, but they're not on the list here. Okay. 
Oh, wrong one. Let's come back over here. Okay. So we've got globalization of markets. We have globalization of production. We've talked about the idea of made in America and how that works with globalization of production. Um, let's now define what is international business. Okay. So what we're looking at here is cross-border exchanges of goods, services, or resources, such as people, intellectual property, contract, assets, things like that, between two or more nations. It's very simple, very straightforward. Um, let's break it down just a little. Selling of goods, import, export, selling of services, um, so, for example, internet services, telephone services, things like that, that's international, and resources. So, yes, we can ship people overseas to work, or we can ship people here overseas to work, immigrant labor, expat labor. We're going to be talking in depth about that throughout these lectures. Um, intellectual property, licenses, patents, things like that, um, contractual assets or liabilities, all of these things are part of international business. And they're big. This is big. So let's play with Utah for a moment, okay? Um, Rio Tinto is an Australian company and employs 46,000 people across 36 countries, including 2,000 direct jobs here in Utah and 14,000 indirect jobs. Now, let's make sure we understand that. 2,000 direct jobs means that Rio Tinto themselves, an Australian company, employs 2,000 Utahns. However, it also employs 14, it creates 14,000 other jobs. This can be things like contract labor, outsource labor, um, you know, suppliers who support the Rio Tinto place, such as cafeteria, cleaning, staff, and so forth. Maybe they contract with another small company as a vendor or supplier. It can also mean jobs that support those 2,000 employees. So let's say that 1,000 of those 2,000 employees live in the daybreak area and in Harriman and so forth. Well, you need school teachers, you need police officers, you need grocers, you need all kinds of people to support those folks. So in other words, jobs beget jobs. And so, you know, an Australian company can have a significant impact on Utah. Let's continue down this a little bit. Metals um, make up 40% of Utah's exports. And Rio Tinto Kennecott is a major player in this industry. So, yeah, Utah exports a ton. And yet, 40% of our exports is metals. Later, when we talk about exports, we'll see what the other exports are. They include IT and so forth. But metals, 40%, man. If it weren't for an Australian company, we would not be as rich and secure and solid as a state economy as we are. Furthermore, in 2017, um, Utah exported over $11.5 billion worth of goods and services, and nearly one in four Utah jobs is tied to international trade. 25% of Utah jobs are tied to international trade. Um, that's big, folks. That is significant. Now, um, I just saw a report this morning that showed, and I, I ought to see if I can find it and send it to you guys. Uh, Utah's economy for the past year ranked number one in the entire nation um, based on a variety of criteria and so forth. Uh, Utah regularly 
ranks number one in the nation's economies. We have a pretty darn solid, consistent um, economy here. Well, a lot of that is tied to international trade, a ton of it, right? We're not just some little backwater state. We're a major player in this. Um, where do we trade? Where do we send this stuff? Well, our top trading partners here in Utah um, are the United Kingdom, followed by Hong Kong, Canada, China, and Mexico. Now, for the entire nation, I believe Canada and Mexico swap back and forth from number one. I think it's Mexico number one and Canada number two. But for Utah, we have United Kingdom and Hong Kong and so forth up at the top. Um, Daniela, um, many produ um, products that we manufacture go to Asia, Europe, and everywhere. Yes, and that's a great real world example of the things that you produce. And yeah, I, if you're right, because right here we've got Europe, United Kingdom ish, right? Um, Hong Kong, Asia, Canada, North America, China, Far East, Mexico, down in, in South America. Well, still North America. Mexico is still North America, but it's heading on down. So there goes South. But North America, know your geography, which I don't. Okay. So the point of this is that international trade is a big deal here for the state of Utah. Okay. So that's what I wanted to explore today. Yes, I understand it's a fairly short lecture. We want to kind of work into this. But what I'd like to do is open things up for questions now. Um, and before you drop off, don't drop off yet, do this. Send me an email that says 103710. Now, let me explain 103710. You were able to get, and Alma, we have you here, um, some apps such as uh, Itak. I can't read it. It's over there. Um, Itakagi or Itagi. Um, you hire language tutors from all over the world. Twice a week, I work and live with a tutor from Taiwan. Other VP kids and, you know, virtual and so forth, local friends. Yes, that is a great real world example. Thank you. Very good. Very good. Send me an email that says 103710. All that means is that you were part of the lecture today and you got us up to 10 and more awesome comments. We almost got to 10 contributors. That's going to be a little tough because we only have like, you know, I handful of, of contributors, but that's okay. We'll get there. Um, and real world comments. I want to give you extra credit for having participated in such a solid way through your contributions, okay, through your comments. So with that, let me pause and see if there are any questions, any comments at all. And Ren, oh yeah, don't anybody Actually, Ren, yeah, that's right. I didn't thank you for calling that out. Um, just send me the email, 103710. Everyone gets that extra credit. Um, let me see if there are any comments, any questions, anything that I can clarify. As I mentioned, this was a fair, fairly short lecture today, but the others, as we get more involved, will become more involved. Next week, when we, not next week, I apologize. On Thursday, when we come back, um, we're going to go into the dark underbelly of international trade, international business. Yes, it's pretty awesome. Yes, it provides us all kinds of amazing things. Yes, I'm a big fan. But that doesn't mean we should turn a blind eye to the real costs that it brings about. So that's going to be Thursday's lecture. So, Otherwise, everyone, thank you very much for joining. Have a uh, fantastic Monday and we will, oh no, Tuesday, and we'll uh, talk to you again on Thursday. I'm going to be sticking around, but in the meantime, uh, we'll talk to you later. Thanks a lot.